Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. In this video, we will explain pre-auricular approach. The pre-auricular approach give access to fractures in the mandibular condylar head and neck region. Many surgeons who perform temporomandibular giant surgery routinely use this incision to access the temporomandibular giant. The illustration demonstrates the excess and the amount of exposure. Branches of the facial nerve may be involved in this incision and dissection. The frontal or temporal branch of the facial nerve used in this video are one and the same thing. The superficial uh, temporal artery and vein are commonly encountered in this surgical approach. The vessels should be conserved if possible. The exposure offered by the pre-auricular approach is limited. Only a limited portion of the condylar neck region can be reached. The preparation and draping should expose the entire ear and lateral canthus of the eye. Shaving the pre-auricular hair is optional. A sterile a plastic drape can be used to keep the hair out of the surgical field. Cotton soaked in mineral oil or antibiotic ointment may be placed into the external auditory canal. Incision is outlined at the junction of the facial skin with the helix of the ear. A natural skin fold along the entire length of the junction of the incision can be reached. If none is present, posterior digital pressure on the pre-auricular skin usually creates a skin fold that can be marked. The incision extends superiorly to the top of the helix and may include an interior or hockey stick extension. The use of solution containing vasoconstrictors ensures hemostasis at surgical site. Two options currently available are the use of local anesthetic or a physiologic solution with vasoconstrictor alone. Use of local anesthetic with vasoconstrictor may impair the facial nerves function and also interfere the use of a nerve stimulator during the surgical procedure. Therefore, consideration should be given to using a physiologic solution with vasoconstrictor alone or injecting the local anesthetic with a vasoconstrictor very superficially. Muscle relaxants used in general anesthesia can also impair nerve function and must be avoided. Make the incision in a pre-auricular skin crease from the level of the helix above the tragus to the level of the lobule. Here you can see the initial incision made in the pre-auricular skin fold. Carry the incision through the skin and subcutaneous tissue to the depth of the temporalis fascia. The temporalis fascia is a glistening white tissue layer that is best appreciated in the incisions superior portion. The superficial temporal vessels may be retracted interiorly with the skin flap, sectioning some posterior and superior branches are left in place. The zygomatic arch can be easily palpated at this point of dissection. The lateral pole of the mandibular condyle can also be palpated. Palpation can be facilitated by having a surgical assistant to manipulate the jaw. There are two portions of the incision. One portion is above the zygomatic arch. This is the zygomatic arch. So one portion is above the level of the zygomatic arch. This is a superior portion. And the one that is below the level of the zygomatic arch, that is the inferior portion. In superior portion, the dissection should be done to the level of the superficial layer of the temporalis fascia. This layer is usually hypovascular. Similarly, dissection below the zygomatic arch along the external auditory meters to the same depth. Blunt dissection with periosteal elevators undermines the superior portion uh, of the incision so that Flap can be retracted interiorly for approximately 1 to 1.5 centimeter. The flap is also dissected interiorly at the level of the superficial or outer level of the temporalis fascia. Here you can see the temporalis fascia. 
the superficial temporal vessels and auriculotemporal nerve may be retracted anteriorly in the flap as pointed earlier flavor to develop flap close to the close to the auditory canal increases the risk of damage to these structures now below the zygomatic arch dissection proceeds bluntly adjacent to the external auditory cartilage scissors dissection proceeds along the external auditory cartilage in an avascular plane between it and the glenoid lobe of the parotid gland the external auditory cartilage runs in tero medially and the dissection is parallel to the cartilage the depth of the dissection at this point should be similar to that above the zygomatic arch that is superficial layer of the temporal fascia now attention uh, again turns to the portion of the incision above the zygomatic arch make an oblique incision parallel to the course of the frontal branch of the facial nerves through the superficial layer of the temporal fascia above the zygomatic arch here you can see uh, uh, that uh, with the flap retracted interiorly an oblique incision is made through the superficial or outer layer of the temporal fascia beginning from the root of the zygomatic arch just in front of the tragus interior superiorly towards the upper corner of the retracted flap the fat globules contained between the superficial and deep layer of the temporal fascia are then exposed at the root of the zygoma the incision can be through both the superficial layer of the temporal fascia and the periosteum of the zygomatic arch now insert the periosteal elevator beneath the superficial layer of the temporal fascia and strip the periosteum of the lateral zygomatic arch dissection will be carried inferiorly to expose the capsule of the temporomandibular joint here you can see the sharp end of the periosteal elevator is inserted in the facial incision deep to the superficial layer of the temporal fascia and uh, swept back and forth to dissect this tissue from the underlying areolar and adipose tissue the periosteal elevator is used to strip periosteum of the lateral portion of the zygomatic arch and continues the dissection below the arch just superficial to the capsule of the temporomandibular joint uh, this illustration shows the coronal view of the dissection to the lateral portion of the zygomatic arch and mandibular condylar region because of the subperiosteal dissection along the lateral surface of the zygomatic arch the temporal or frontal branches of the facial nerve are located within the substance of the retracted flap the undermining proceeds inferiorly towards the zygomatic arch where the sharp end of the periosteal elevator uh, cleaves the attachment of the periosteum at the junction of the lateral and superior surface of the zygomatic arch freeing the periosteum from its lateral surface is pointed earlier the periosteal elevator can then be used to continue bluntly dissecting inferiorly with the back and forth motion taking care not to dissect medially into the tmj uh, as we explained or explained in the previous slide blunt dissection with scissors can also be used to dissect inferiorly to the zygomatic arch once the dissection uh, is approximately 1 cm 1 uh, cm below the arch the intervening uh, tissue uh, is sharply released posteriorly along the plane of the uh, initial incision here you can see a vertical incision made through the intervening tissue just in front of the external auditory meatus Uh, to the depth of the periosteal elevator the entire flap is then retracted anteriorly and blunt dissection at this depth proceeds anteriorly until the articular eminence is exposed the entire tmj capsule then be re revealed to help and determine the location of the articular space the mandible can be manipulated open and closed in rare case of treating condylar head fracture the tmj capsule is horizontally incised at the level where the capsule meets the condylar neck 
Now, after a, a retraction of tissue superficial to the temporomandibular giant capsule, scissors are used to enter the capsule. Initial point of entry is just below the zygomatic arch, continuing parallel to the contour of the TMJ fossa. Lateral retraction of the capsule allows entrance into the superior giant space. Dissection can be carried inferiorly in a subperiosteal plane to reach the neck of the mandibular condyle. The inferior giant space is opened by making an incision in the disc along its lateral attachment to the condyle within the lateral recess of the upper giant space. The incision may be extended posteriorly into the attachment tissues. The inferior giant space is then entered. Here you can see the incision through the lateral attachment of the temporomandibular giant disc entering the interior giant space. Now, uh, closure of the inferior giant space using running suture between lateral disc attachment and the giant space. The giant spaces are irrigated thoroughly and any hemorrhage is controlled before closure. The inferior giant space is closed with permanent or slowly resorbing suture by suturing the disc back to its lateral condylar attachment. The superior giant space is closed by suturing the uh, incised edge with the remaining capsular attachment on the temporal component of the TMJ. Here you can see closure of the superior giant space uh, using running suture between the remnants of the temporomandibular giant capsule on the zygomatic arch here this is the remnant of the on the zygomatic arch and the uh, tmj capsule below and if no such attachments were left attached to the bone the capsule can be resuspended over the zygomatic arch to the temporal fascia subcutaneous tissues are closed with resorbable sutures no suture uh, deeper than subcutaneous tissues are required the skin is then closed. A running subcuticular uh, sutures make removal simple and allows a delay in a removal if necessary. Here you can see the closure of the preauricular skin incision with running subcuticular suture, a pressure, pressure dressing and or a drain is usually applied but may be used according to the surgeon's preference. If the TMJ capsule has been incised uh, to access the condylar head, it must be closed as the first step. The temporalis fascia is closed as the next step. The skin and the subcutaneous sutures are placed. Thank you. Have a nice time.